My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jim, what weekend is it? July 17th. One thing I'm curious about this week, man, I'm curious if you signed up, if you were one of the one million people who pledged to storm Area 51 <laughs> in September. I did not, but I love this story. <laughs> and I'm very curious to see it play out. We're sitting here laughing, and you just gave the date. It's July whatever the fuck you said it was, man. In case somebody is watching this after September, uh, let me tip so let me tip a little out for the fallen people who died in the massacre of Area 51 in September 2019. <laughs> Those brave, unironic heroes. <laughs> Truthfully, though, Jim, law of averages. If, if, if a million people sign up for this thing. 900,000 people know it's a joke, right? At least. I was trying to figure out the over-under, <laughs> too, and guessing, like, 3,000 people show up? Like, it, it doesn't take too many for it to be a real problem and to get out of control very, very quickly. Do you think it will? Because I kind of do. Uh, I have... I have some faith in humanity, but it doesn't get un unanimous praise from Eddie P. I think there are knuckleheads out there, and I think there are people who are going to at least show up and cause a problem. I would guess people show up. I think they're stupid if they don't make some sort of big convention out of that weekend. Uh, lots of conspiracists, <laughs> conspiracy lore, lots of, uh, almost. I'm going to say fandom, even though that's probably not the right word around it. So by all means, build that, go to Roswell or wherever is close to Area 51 that you would have this and, and make it a fun event. And I assume that will happen. I saw uh, some someone from the Air Force released a statement on it. So I feel like everybody's going to take the risk seriously and keep it under control. Man, just from like our conversations off camera, I thought you had a, at least a little less faith in humanity than, than you do. Well, I think people are gonna need to be prepared for it. I assume it could go sideways. I just assume <laughs> there are level heads out there. Maybe I'm hopeful. There's a lot of warning for it, right? 500 people? <laughs> like, basically, I'm just chilling at the crib with popcorn, hitting refresh on CNN.com or something, because there has to be a knucklehead climbing the fence, man. It's just going to get freaking collateral murder, drone footage, missile, fucking body parts explode, yeah. and nobody, el like, nobody else storms the gates, man. We should make some Bob Lazar shirts. I saw that guy's name on a Joe Rogan, but I don't know who he is. Tell me. He was one of the early scientists that came out and said the government was working on UFOs, and he knows that because he was one of the scientists working on them. And there's a Netflix documentary that just came out, which is the reason I think he was on Joe Rogan recently to promote the uh, documentary. Interesting. Did it make you a believer? No. I, I listened to the Joe Rogan episode, but I did not make it through the documentary. Yeah. We're sort of burying the lead in a small way, man, because it's, <laughs> it's Comic-Con weekend. Oh, yes. It all comes full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, we're not pro broadcasters, man. Screw the segue. Comic-Con, huge event. Um, has Comic-Con peaked? I feel like the energy is not there this year the way I've seen it in the past few. It seems to be like one of those things that everybody begrudgingly has to participate in. All the news outlets are there. You and I are here. And, <laughs> and, and we're always asked, I'm sure you got a million emails. Where are you going to be at? Let's get lunch. Let's get dinner. First off, I'm shocked that people like spend their own money to go out there. I don't have any idea how you could possibly make that cost effective. And I remember seeing cartoonists sort of doing their breakdowns about like table costs, hotel costs, flights, and being salty that like they didn't like make returns and shit. And it's like, well, of course you didn't make a return. The only reason that business still has us there is because it's in its like nonprofit charter that like comic people have to it's a comic con they would be very happy to fucking boot us the fuck out of there and just get like bigger space for some netflix shit yeah they do not want us <laughs> but if they don't want to pay taxes right they got to keep us it's like the nfl you know yeah it really is and i just heard an inter a podcast with san diego's mayor and I know that's why he was on there, is yeah. to you know, promote this giant event, their big annual event. Sort of like our furry convention here in Pittsburgh. You know, I guess cities are competing for whatever puts them on the map, and obviously there's a lot of business that comes out of it. I've been there several times. I think you've been there several times. I love that it exists. I love its history. 50 years is awesome. It's cool to think like Jack Kirby's early there. Uh, the Hernandez brothers I always associate with that show. 
so there's a lot of great history there, and I love all of that. I personally, it's not my favorite show. I like comics. There are right. a lot of shows that are much more comic centric, easier to navigate, more affordable, whatever, you know, myriad of, of list of reasons why I'd prefer a different show if all my interest is comics. But it's kind of awesome that comics are still at the center of this gigantic pop cultural event. Like, it's certainly, it's got to be the biggest pop culture event, you know, in terms of coverage and things coming out of the U.S., right? Uh, I think so. And, and comics easily. are, at least in name, centerpiece of that. So I think that's pretty awesome. I think it's part of what has changed the image of comics over the last 20 years. For Hollywood, right? No, I feel like it's a, uh, it's what people think of, right? It's like Big Bang or something. Like, like sure. my aunt, who's never read a comic book, knows comics because of Big Bang and because of Comic-Con. She asks me every year about Comic-Con. Right. And it's because of that show. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's brand association. It's not, it's not much different than the Marvel superhero movies. You know, like people know all of those things much more than they know any comics. Mm -hmm. But they're related. You know, it's, 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 it's made comics, I don't know, kind of a, I hate to say renaissance, but it's certainly popularized comics in a way that they weren't popular when I was a kid. In name. In name and concept. I mean, I, I think it's all connected. Libraries ca carrying comics. I think they're all connected. Just a greater awareness of comics. And I think you can point to Comic-Con as being a big part of that. You know, one time I was out there for and, and signed at the Top Shelf booth. The other time was with uh, Fantagraphics. It felt like we were the Spartans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were the 300. Yes. And uh, there was like, we had to contend with all the rest of it. And the first time I was out there, it was right after, it was the year after uh, Dylan Williams passed. Oh man, I have a Comic-Con Dylan Williams story. You want to say, say yours first? And then I'll, and then I'll, sure. I'll do mine. If, if that works. I, I think mine will close. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so friends of Dylan Williams, you know, Spark Plugs publisher turned me on to a lot of good comics, kind of affected the way I think about comics. And he would always set up. Indies, there's like a small indie island in Comic Con. I don't know if it still exists, but it used to be. And it's, that's and and like the centerpiece, the, in the island was Top Shelf had that big space, Fantagraphics drawn in quarterly, and then you would see those little right. booths. So I, I was talking to Dylan there, you know, hanging out, having fun. And this is about when I was working on Aphrodisiac. So I was looking for comics that were uh, featured African American characters, and he's like, "Have you heard of Real Deal?" And I was like, no, I haven't. I thought I was pretty, you know, up to date. I had been working on this for a couple of years. And, and so he's describing this comic, Real Deal, that's, it's, it was by, I think, a couple of L.A. creators, but they would come to Comic-Con and set up and self-publish this comic. And, and it was great. It sounded amazing. Everything he described, I was like, man, I need this. So I then proceed the rest of Comic-Con to go to every single comic book selling booth there, asking about Real Deal and trying to find this Real Deal comic, and came away with nothing. And I was half convinced it was just a hoax that he was pulling on me, where I'm just like looking for this MacGuffin that doesn't exist and running around Comic-Con, but had a really good time doing it because it did make me go into all the comic book bins and everywhere I could find comics, man, uh, which doesn't always happen at, com at, at Comic-Con. But you didn't come out with a real deal? Came out with none. And like I said, man, I was on the plane ride home thinking, maybe that's not true. Like maybe that thing doesn't exist. Since then, I have gotten all of them, and Fantagraphics has released a great collection, so anybody that's interested in this comic, well worth seeking out and easy to find now in a really nice edition. And Kayfabe related, uh, you could see glimpses of it in our Outlaw Comics uh, episode. I have, an, I have a Lawrence Hubbard story after the Dylan <laughs> thing, uh, but it was just very simply, it's the, it's, the, it's the year after Dylan passes, and he had that booth, the booth that you went to for years and years, and... He passes, and very quickly, uh, that next year, like, the Suicide Girls scoop it up. Oh, wow. So that's, that's Comic-Con to me. Is like yeah, that's, that's not a good... People, uh... people hold their spot, you know, like Dan Vado, Slave Labor. I don't know that they put out a comic in a decade. Maybe they did, you know. Sorry if you did, and I didn't see it. But the comics that they have there, pretty ratty old copies of Johnny the Homicidal Maniac or something. And they, it looks like they buy that space to just retain that amazing piece of real estate but the second you sneeze it's almost like uh those trolls online who will scoop up your url the second right. like it lapses you like there's going to be a schmuck that gets that spot if you don't vig hyper vigilantly 
put your money down and, and retain it, you know, and, and keep that thing. Yeah, the first time I ever went to a Comic Con, and I think the only time I actually paid my way there, I did. I signed at SLG's booth, and man, that was primo real estate. It was like the middle of the convention floor. When you walked in, there it was. Mm -hmm. Really awesome space. It'd be tough to give that up, you know. Like, <clears throat> For I, like, sure. like I don't know that it's uh, uh, from the sound of some things I heard. Like those spaces are, in a matter of speaking, almost like rent controlled. Like, like yes. the next people that would get that space might have to pay ten thousand dollars more than what you paid yeah that, that wouldn't surprise me at all i have uh my memories from that first show that i ever went to you know that's a mythic comic-con right you know I, i've been making comics for a few years before i actually went and so uh walking around there one it's very overwhelming i stayed like a mile away in in this area that had no convenience stores it was just like where are we and uh went with scott mills but i remember just walking around and seeing so much original art and that was like my big takeaway from that show was just getting to see like Jack Kirby originals. And the one that always stood out to me was the Devil Dinosaur two-page spread of like the big, almost like tribal style right. Devil Dinosaur coming out was there and was just gorgeous. You know, like two pages, black and white. It, it was amazing. Um, so it, it was pretty good. You know, I, I, that would have been like 04, 05. I think the Transformers movies were just starting to develop and one of their gimmicks was they had a tractor trailer parked in the middle of the convention center. And that was it. It was like Transformers logo on the side of a freaking trailer in the middle of this mass of humanity. <laughs> Can I tell my little... Uh, like, yes, hit it. Like, I was signing at the Fanta table and speaking with uh, Johnny Ryan. And, and Johnny Ryan really helps boost the signal to real deal comics as far as, far as I'm concerned. Um, I've ha I had two copies for a really long time. Shouts to, to Dan Allen, local Pittsburgh uh, comics proprietor, because he hooked me up with like just stacks of, when he started having babies, needed to make space in the house, man. Wow. And he gave me like all of his Grand Royal magazines, like real deal comics and junk. And those things were fascinating documents, never heard of it, like any of that. But for a while, that company, Stussy or mm -hmm. Stussy, like each season, there would be a new cartoonist, signature like line of shirts whatever whatever they and they went through all the ones that you would think of they went through Klaus, they went through pete bag and then uh lawrence hubbard but i didn't recognize the name because real dope comics are drawn by r bone i believe and uh and the video was fly uh the intro video with the stussy thing and i, and I caught a glimpse of the man and he looks like he should has a cane he looks like Iceberg Slim. Yeah. A little bit. So I'm out there signing and I'm talking with Johnny Ryan. And I see the man. And I'm like, is that our bone? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, you want to meet him? And I'm like, please, man. <laughs> so so uh, I went over and I, I, I met the dude. And they had uh, the I, probably the newest issue. I think the one with uh, Cy, Cy Cops or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, I think that was our issue seven. And then I went to his table, scooped it up, and, and we were talking. And he had a dude there with him running this table that had all gold teeth and a tattooed tear, man. And that's supposed to mean murder, I think. Like, you killed somebody. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, man, he really hangs out with some tough customers. Yeah. And he's not faking the funk, man. On, on but, brand, as they say. Yeah, yeah. But this... Super nice, you know. Yeah, I follow. You know, we follow each other on social media. Shout to Lawrence comments. Hubbard. Yeah, give him give him a follow. People that are into Outlaw Comics, into our comics, I think you'd find something you like there. I think he's a really good cartoonist. So uh, fun fun guy to follow. There was uh, the when I was out there as a guest, and it's always like, see, I'm spoiled from that man. Like you get to be at the hotel that's attached to the convention center, so you basically don't even have to like leave. It's very nice uh, to to like go to the floor. Which is awesome. Why did I bring that up? Oh, because uh, on pr on the preview night, I brought uh, you could you could bring a plus one. Yes. So I brought uh, Ben Mara with me, and his book Omwat, One Man War on Terror <laughs> <laughs> just came out, and they gave us a table. I believe uh, that one might have been on the outlaw outlaw episode also. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And and uh, let's 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 hit it with another outlaw <laughs> contender man. But our table was catty corner to Tim Vigil's table. And you look at Ben's work, and Vigil's clearly an inspiration for the material. And I don't know that Ben really ever talked to him. I guess he never got very much out of Vigil as 
you know, like I never did either, but he had this thing and I was like, well, let's just, uh, let's go over and show and let's go over and show him. But Ben had it to like give, you know, like he had a couple copies because that book was brand new. So we went over, we're chatting with him and he gives uh, Vigil the omelette and Vigil opens it and is looking at certain parts and passages <laughs> and is like reciting them almost in the voice of the characters guffawing laughing have a good old time now this is before the show like is truly open to the public and we are standing within eye an eye line of the gates the door the doors that are going to open whenever they blow the whistle or however they let everybody <laughs> know it's time to go and vigil looks at us and he's like it's a good conversation fellas but you might not want to be standing right there now his, his table is like a corner table so there's all this space. What are you talking about? Like, why? what are you talking about, man? He's like, all right, suit yourselves. <laughs> and on the loudspeaker, what they do is they almost like, they read the rule book uh, before they open these doors. And they say, please don't run far more than once. <laughs> <laughs> and it's utterly meaningless yes. once they open these gates. And you see these people with their little, like, they have time to stand there in the line, right, and plan their trajectory of, like, all of the booths that they are going to hit, one after the other after the other, with their big-ass bags. Because have you ever seen plastic bags so big? <laughs> they give these plastic bags. I think about bags, that all the time. Yeah, yeah, they give these. I see, it's all coming back, man. It's like it's like flashbacks. <laughs> they give those bags, and they have to be three feet square I was thinking or, or three bigger. Feet. And then and then they hand them to everybody and go, okay, now how many people can f we fit in this tiny little space? <laughs> These giant ass bags. It's, it's, it seems like a disaster, but and you I just, guess it works out. You know, I think there's strategy involved <laughs> because it's almost like strategy is get out of that aisle, son. <laughs> you discover that, but what the strategy is on the Comic Con's part, very smart, is like if you ever see those crazy nitro cars or something, man, and like when they need to stop that little parachute comes out like when these guys run it kind of slows the run a little bit when it catches the air and it gets fat and they're just like they yes. they can't run as fast as they normally would once very smart that thing gets full it's like a parachute <laughs> but needless to say we damn near got mowed over by hordes of very nerdy people and 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 the, and the things that were high on the bucket list for all these people uh apparently was this is when ash versus evil dead was brand new they had like a little set you know uh, a diorama or or whatever you can walk through it so it's bigger than, you know what i'm talking about um but they were giving out foam hand chainsaws kind of like the foam finger and like yeah. wrestling game. like so that's what everybody was like running for first yeah um, i want one of those no you don't i would wear it on the show <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I get like six of them now. <laughs> I don't really want one of those. Anybody that's watching. Ah, <laughs> uh, geez, man. Um, I brought uh, Tom out one time. Mm -hmm. I was a guest. Brought Tom out as a, as a plus one. And he shows up. I don't think he'll mind me telling this story. But he, he only came out for like a couple of days. And so like he, you know, bussed to the airport, flew out, maybe had a layover somewhere. Time change, ends up getting there about early in the day, you know, 12, 1 o'clock or something. But he had already been traveling and up for, like, a day. And <laughs> packing backpacks and bags full of heavy, super heavy books, goes straight to the con, from the airport straight to the con, sells all day, signs, does all that stuff. It was when he was doing Godland at Image. And I think he had those big hardcovers, like the, the giant oversized right. hardcovers. So, like, he's packing those things across the country and carrying those around. Sells all day. Then we go out somewhere, you know, to get food and drink and hang out with some people socializing and stuff. And, like, halfway through dinner, he just gets up and leaves. Doesn't say anything. And I'm like, oh, man, who? what did we do? Did we do something wrong? And uh, so I, I catch up with him later that night. Actually, I think the next day, because he just went back and, like, crashed. And that's what it was. It was just travel all day on the road on his feet. And uh, it just, he just hit a wall, which I've had that experience at shows. I, I did too. Uh, well, the one year at Heroes, on, on that Sunday, I just didn't sleep too good for, for, for two days at the show. I never sleep good the day before. And I was like nauseously tired. Like, like I was so tired, 
I felt like I could throw up. Yeah. And that's happened to me several times, like just here working where I'm like, I better go to sleep because I feel like I want to throw up. I'm so tired. And that doesn't make sense, you know, but that definitely happened. And you are triggering more things <laughs> with, 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 with the Tom experience because travel in the United States of America is dominated by the San Diego Comic-Con in every airport in America. It is the talk amongst amongst pilots, amongst <laughs> stewardess, amongst amongst the people at the at the gate. And uh, there is no direct flight from Pittsburgh to San Diego. Like it bums me out. Like I wish we were a bigger metro where we could have that luxury. So that that the time I'm thinking about, we had to get off in Houston, go from Houston to San Diego. And the plane from Houston to San Diego was was a small flight, uh, one of those kind of like, but almost like a flying bus, you know, two seats, a piece, like a tall dude like me, I, I feel like I could touch yeah. both windows. 99% uh, of the people on this plane were going to Comic-Con, and there was like maybe one or two uh, people in like business attire and shit who were just like, what is this? <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> Here, I'll try it again. <laughs> and the, the and these business people are just like, what kind of twilight zone zone am I in? Everybody knows each other. <laughs> uh, nobody has natural colored hair. I'm saying blue, reds, uh, all kinds of weird things. Uh, sailor outfits, like girls running around in sailor outfits. Dudes running around with elf ears. What is this? Like because you could tell that they're squares and so unhip to what's happening. And I feel like they didn't even they didn't appreciate the flight. <laughs> <laughs> sure they didn't. It was so odd too because I was talking to a lot of people on that because it's like I could talk to the people here, here, to the side of me, behind me, and it was just like a conversation because everybody was just chatty, chatty Cathy's, man. Yeah, a lot of high, high energy on the way there. Zero people. People crashing on the way back. Totally. Zero people there for comic books. None. Absolutely zero. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, man. Because that would, would have been my first uh, experience there. Now, like when I was there as a guest, it was, it was probably the best experience you could have. Because you're there, you're a guest. That was the year we won the Eisner. But in order to get to where the Eisner ceremony is, you go out the back of the hotel and there's like, there's like a trail along the waterfront of, of wherever. The, is that the ocean? That's not the ocean, is it? No, no it's a, a bay, right? Yeah, I guess. But anyhow. That trail's great. I yeah. run on that trail and there's like the aircraft carrier is, is parked on one end of it, which yeah. is just awesome. Never I think got, you can tour that. Never got that far. You know you're in San Diego when uh, you're in like the Uber or whatever and you're heading to, to the joint and you pass like the pirate ships. But anyhow, like Comic-Con is already underway for days at this point. I think the Eisner ceremony is on a Friday. The people there are, are, are camping out for Hall H. Right. The big one, right? Jim, they're pissing in their groups. Like, they're not leaving the group to piss. Like, they're pissing right, right there. And you smell it, and you see it. And we go to the Eisner ceremony. We won. So that was a cool thing. Uh, I forget who... Uh, you're, you won the Eisner first. I forget who the, the guests were who presented it. But it was like, I gave two shits about the Eisner until you got it. And then I'm like, oh well, I want one now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't let Jim be the only guy. And in fact, I said that when when I accepted mine, uh, and and it was it was I did I, I was uh, presented it by the perfect guy for the job for me specifically. It was uh, Jonathan Ross, the the BBC guy who did the Where Is Steve Ditko mm -hmm. documentary, and he has like a kind of like a Letterman type talk show. So it's like he's a big comic book mark did that Steve Ditko documentary, and on his regular show, has guests like Jay-Z on there, so like the hip-hop and comics thing, and that's, like I talked to him more than I talked on the mic, because I was just like, oh man, I love the Steve Ditko thing, like just like a way, like just like, yeah. whatever, uh, man, I love that Steve Ditko thing, man, so good, and he's like, oh, no, no, you should probably, like, and I'm like, cool, and then I just said exactly what I said, I was like, yeah, I didn't want this until Jim Rugg got it, <laughs> he couldn't be the only guy to bring one of these back to Pittsburgh, thank you. Like, and then, and then bounce, you know what I'm saying, man? And they ask you in the back, like, they put you on camera, like, what does the Eisner mean to you and all that? 
uh, or, or like, is it meaningful? And I'm just like, yeah, sure. Like, I'm not gonna kiss ass. And, and like, I really, my love, it's a love hate relationship I have with it because it's the only time in my life I have to acknowledge I'm a loser, you know, like where it's like, like I'll lose this weekend because if the CIA can rig elections <laughs> and get despots put in place, uh, the CIA is going to be able to get certain comics people Eisner Awards, man. They're not going to have trouble with that, man, <laughs> rigging that shit. So, I hope the CIA is, is behind the Eisners. So curse you guys, man, for not, for not uh, installing, installing me <laughs> in, in the uh, category for uh, Best Limited Series, man. And, and you put one of your, 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 your moles <laughs> in, in, into the position to have yet another Eisner Award, man. I see what you guys are doing. <laughs> That's hilarious. You know, they're, they're creating <laughs> propaganda. Like, I always think about, I always think about like... Uh, you see, like, the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary where, where they talk about some of the propaganda stuff and how it's, like, out of airplanes, they're dropping f comics, basically. I'm telling you, man. Wasn't you got, it, weren't, the, weren't there uh, Freedom of Information Act document releases that, that showed CIA backing, like, uh, abstract expressionism and various postmodern and modern art movements? That's amazing, man. But uh, put something in the comments if, if uh, there's any I'm, intel I'm on that. I'm pretty sure that I, that's I would read true. About that. There's, there's some, some, I feel like I've read some stuff about that. After the Eisners, walk back to the hotel, use that trail, all you smell is ammonia. Like, these motherfuckers, and it's adults. Like, it's not little kids, man, who are, who are out there pissing on that trail. Why don't they leave the line? Like, nobody's standing in that line. Nobody's there by themselves. Get out of the line and use the bathroom is what we're saying, <laughs> yes, man. Yes, please. Because, because the whole way, I just smelled ammonia. Yeah, I, I don't like that. Yeah, it was disgusting. All for, uh, I believe... The Deadpool trailer. Well, that makes sense then. I'm back <laughs> on board. You guys do what you gotta do. <laughs> Man, I sure hope we have some cool stuff to present in terms of like things that are announced and released at Comic-Con. Uh, the beauty of it is we don't know what we don't know, so there might be some really sexy stuff. I have one hope uh, for some clarity and some some further information when it comes to the complete Katsuhiro Otomo stuff. I'd like to know release dates. Uh, when is it going to, you know, when's this thing going to start? We start from the beginning. Sometimes it's not the smartest move for these, like, big collections. Yeah, right. Because of diminishing returns. <clears throat> and they should do a deluxe beautiful Domu to start with. Because be you smart. could sell a bunch of those. I think so. And, and, and you would make fans that wanted more. I think so, too. And, and, and maybe, maybe that is what they'll do. So we better divest ourselves of our long boxes full of Domu before... <laughs> Before that, uh, because we because what they don't know is that we control Domu <laughs> like uh, De Beers diamonds. Right. You know, we just like leak small bits of those on the market, man, so that we can buy yet another ivory back scratcher. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing I'm I'm really most excited for that I know is in the works and is a long time coming. I have like all the trades in Japanese. Got to get my hands on that stuff. Speaking of which, man, I have to thank everybody out there who's been to Japan, who gave me some marching orders, some ideas about how to uh, conduct myself over there. I do not want to be a schmuck and be disrespectful in terms of etiquette and all of that. So I'm, I'm slowly gaining ground uh, in that respect. I discovered a um, really weird YouTube rabbit hole. Somebody posted a thing for a video series called Abroad in Japan, which is great. Anybody who has plans going over there, like it's worth checking out this series. There's a, about 147 videos, so I could probably catch them all before I split. But it, it sent me down this other weird rabbit hole of like watching chefs prepare sushi from like slaughter to plate. And it's just very interesting to me. Um, there's this part where like things are just so gory and disgusting. Like when you see the organ meat, since like the organs, it feels fucked up. So like one thing I was thinking was just, man, thank the heavens that there are people who do that so that I don't have to because like I just couldn't and I love this stuff. But there was one piece that I saw that I felt like is worth talking about because I think it'll el elicit a reaction uh, depending on how many vegans we have here. Let's see how many thumbs down we gets on this video. <laughs> oh boy. But it was like, a, the chef was making a sweet and sour 
frog uh, concoction, you know, just like sweet and sour chicken, but except there's going to be frog meat. And he used a, a live frog, and you see you see the butchering of it and all that, and then he quarters it up into like the small pieces. Now, now meat is muscle, right? And the body generates electricity. We generate electricity within us. Um, so this is me, like pop science, trying to explain what the fuck I just saw, uh, because when he seasons these bits after he. Cuts them all up in like little biteable chunks, man, and takes the bones out and all of that. Um, and he's salt, like pepper, salt, and salt's a conductor of electricity. So you're just seeing all these little kibbles and bits of of, of undiscernible meat chunks starting to flex. Wow. Yeah, all over the cutting board. It's a freaky. It felt like. It made me think of EC Comics because my mind is always yeah, right. in, my mind is always in comics, you know. And it made me think of like there was a horror story where where like behind the deli counter, it's all kinds of like hearts and entrails and junk like that. And it I immediately started thinking of EC Comics because I'm just watching these like little muscles like flex and like congeal and move around after this thing's been dead for several minutes. Wow. Yeah. When I was a kid. Uh... I grew up around a lot of animals and hunters and things of that nature. And they would say, like, if, if you killed a snake or if a snake died, it would twitch until, like, the sun would go down. And I never made the, elec the electrical uh, connection, but... That's just my it's guess. Gotta be, it, it, that makes a lot of sense to me because of the way their nervous system and, you know, like, a snake's all sort of big muscle, right, so that it can move and wiggle and all that stuff, so... And also, I don't know how accurate that statement is. That was just the thing that, as a little kid, I was told. <laughs> right, yeah, 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 sure, sure. Should we talk a little more comics talk before uh, before we split? I can talk comics forever. <laughs> we have a signing coming up in, yes. in August. Yes, in Canada, our international signing. I have very few uh, border crossings left in me, man. Yes, I agree. <laughs> it's not my favorite. No, I never, I never have a good time of it. <clears throat> There's like because I'm not used to disrespect. Just in my normal day to day, I don't have to deal with douchebags, except in that situation. I've never had a, a nice, pleasant trip across the Canadian border. Not once. That's interesting. I don't know that I've had terrible personal experiences, but I, especially when I'm flying, I've had running through the airport trying to catch up or make a flight or whatever because of however long it takes to get through one checkpoint or another, uh, which is always stressful. So, I don't know. Air travel just stresses me out. Crossing the border stresses me out. Where, where are we heading? We're heading to Dartmouth, uh, I guess Nova Scotia. And I've never been there. I think it's uh, connected with some of these other cities like Halifax, I think is kind of across some body of water there. But, but Dartmouth, Dartmouth is where we'll be. Um, it's the Dartmouth Comics and Art Festival, August 17th and 18th. And so the 17th is a series of lectures, workshops, things of that nature in their library. Uh, we'll be giving some kind of a presentation talk, something cartoonist kayfabe related uh, on that Saturday. And then Sunday is more of a traditional, at least the way I understand it, more of a traditional comic book festival kind of experience where artists will be set up with their wares and I assume some retailers and stuff, but it'll be like books and sales and art and all of that stuff, meet and greet artists. and Yeah, I think I think what I'm going to end up doing, because I didn't ask for a table or anything like that, uh, and I've never been to Nova Scotia, I'm going to do maybe a, a signing for an hour or two. Bas like, we'll call it an hour or two, but obviously if it goes over, like, I'll, I'll sign until the last thing yeah. get, needs a signature. But I want to check out the scene. I want to check out these tables. I want to see who the local artists are. One of the biggest pleasures of traveling to different regions is kind of seeing what the comics of the region are. There are local talents everywhere that are amazing, and they just don't have, like, they're not, they don't care about, and I say this in a positive way, like, they don't have whatever I have that makes me have to, like, put my shit out there on Instagram all the time and, like, all of that. They're just, like, comfortable, happy, and fucking badass, and I would never know them, become friends with them, uh, get to see their artwork if I didn't travel to their town. Yeah, that's one of my favorite thing of these regional, and any kind of traveling, is always trying to find some of the regional talent. That's that's uh, Because comic shops always end up with some of that stuff, so you'll have like boxes 
you know, from years past of local cartoonists that for whatever reason, it just didn't reach a wider audience. And then certainly the shows are another place where like, you'll see these people that, I don't know, man, it's hard to get caught, you know, like even if they're on Instagram, there's, there's millions of these guys that I haven't, uh, haven't found or haven't crossed paths with. So yeah, I agree with you. That's, that's one of the best parts of these shows. So definitely want to have some time to walk around and see what's going on locally, because that area has a pretty rich history of cartoonists that I do know that have come out of there. You know, Brian Lee O'Malley was there for a while, Hope Larson, Faith Aaron Hicks, uh, Kate Leth. So I think there's a, you know, there's, there's a scene there, um, and I, I'm not very familiar with it. So, yeah, that's something I always look forward to, and this one especially. Like, I do like doing shows in areas I've never done before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot to see. Yeah, I have no, no expectations of, of, of anything. I, I always get nervous going to a new thing because I, uh, one of the insecurities and thoughts that go through my mind is, like, this is going to be the show where nobody shows up <laughs> to the table. You know, the name equity means nothing in this town it's never happened but it could yeah well, yeah i don't know if you can do anything about it if it does no you can't but but i just don't need that reminder we'll have to be on our a game on saturday yeah happy to do it I, I, you know recruit some of these people to come to the table on sunday <laughs> <laughs> dude these uh these uh, alan moore shirts are starting to uh see the light of day man people are starting to buy these things yes. and and one of the things that's amazing with the sort of proportions that we have in, in the scale of that face is seeing motherfuckers oh, put that <laughs> put that Alan Moore face. It's like this exact size of a human head. So like when they drape the shirt over their head and the Moore face is there and it's even like that one is like 80s Alan Moore but when it's on the head and, and there's like the tightness of the shirt, there's a droop to it, like the more modern day Alan Moore <laughs> and it looks amazing. Yeah, I was surprised the first picture of that that I saw where it was like, oh, yeah, yeah. somebody's really smart. Yeah, and that person is uh, the Instagram account Astral Eyes, A-S-T-R-A-L-E-Y-E-S, I believe, one word, Go- like, in the search box, you're going to find it, man. It's, it's a good image, and he's putting up the, the Aleister Crowley freaking devil horns or goat horns or whatever. He's a good follow. He imports some comics and sell and, and sells them online. He's got a good, very robust uh, Instagram account. Yes. It's fun to look at. Yeah. A lot of good comics art there. So when, when are we heading to Nova Scotia? August 17 and 18. Awesome. Let's do some mail. One of, one of the things that I got recently was uh, my homeboy Skinner from Cali sent, sent this book, his... Uh, I think it might be his second book from Last Gasp, just full of his art and uh, talk about robust and awesome uh, Instagram accounts, man. Like, you go to his site, his uh, page, The Art of Skinner, and it's just page after page of of this stuff. Um, just like real, a lot of love crafty and imagery. Self, Great colors, Self-taught too. guy and, and uh, yeah. It, like It just, will make your eyeballs happy. Yeah. Very hardcore metal. It's not for punks, man. So if, you, <laughs> so if you suck, you don't want to go there, man. Only cool people. This arrived in the mail in the P.O. box from uh, Jesse A. DeStacio, and he makes custom toys. So there's a, an assortment of, of kind of cool figures that he has made, but the reason that this is really important to us is one of his first licensed figures is Rax Chaken the Forever Man. It's probably not doing it justice on camera here, but if you're familiar with uh, Chaken as we are, he's a Sega game character out of Ohio. We used to see him at every show that we would do in the Pittsburgh area. Uh, pretty cool to see a, a figure all these years later. Yeah, he said that uh, you know Chakon was a huge influence, man. Perhaps that's the reason why he is uh, a, a toy maker at this point, man. He, he also said, yeah, he sent us a copy. He included a copy of, <laughs> is it Chaken? Chalkin? I call it Chalkin, but it's made up, so call it what you will, man. <laughs> I, next the time forever you, man we can agree on. Next time you see Rack, ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I see Matt Kahn's, uh in, in recent years, what his, his gimmick is uh, getting those like Strathmore trading card mm-hmm. size uh, blank things and doing like the Scotty Young version of, say, Ash from Evil Dead. Or, you know, like with a big head and little cartoon bodies with a color pencil. And, and he just has a gazillion of, like, every pop culture du jour character. Yeah. You know, I'm sure you could find a Walter White if you're looking for <laughs> one. When we did the uh, Tom shoot, one of the questions we asked him was, when the heck is Fantastic Four Grand Design coming out? If it's announced right now, 
uh, what is the release date that they're promoting? He had no idea at the time of the interview. The announcement comes out, and that's when we hit flip the switch and let everybody see the video, but we recorded that ahead of time, and we discovered that Marvel is planning to put out that comic in October, and it made me realize that the, the trio, the Freebirds, have... Uh, <laughs> We, we each have books coming out in October, man, if, if, if it all shakes out correctly, man. So there's going to be, the fin issue one of Fantastic Four Grand Design is going to be out there from Tom. What do you have coming out? Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive from Image Comics is going to be the big trade paperback. This is the cover. Oh, so awesome. I was going to, like, I think I saw some other imagery and it made me wonder if you were, like, doing some kind of different cover. You know what it, you know what it was? It was like a image corner box with Street Angel that you did. And I'm like, oh, is that going to be the cover? It's going to be the back cover. Great. Yeah, I like that image a lot. It's yeah. gotten a good response. So, and that's a that's a beautiful image, man. That's that's one of those. Uh, that's an end cap book. Retailers, if you have end caps, <laughs> tell me those colors are going to like draw a reader, uh, a customer's eye to uh, the product, man. So put that on the end cap. I'm super psyched for it too. You know, you figure out like your cover stocks and how you want this stuff to print and. Everybody likes matte and flat and all of satin finishes, all these different finishes. We I'm do. going with glossy for this thing, and I think it's going to sing like that. It's going to be big and bright, and, and I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah, it's hard, hard to miss that one on the shelf. I agree. I agree, man. And that's going to... So, wait, a $20 book? $20 book, 240 pages, and something like 234 of them are comics. Like, it is just jam-packed of comics. That's it's, good it's value. It's all of the Street Angel comics that aren't in the Ad House hardcover are in this one. That's good value. Full color and just packed to the edges. Yeah, I can't wait, man. That's gonna do that's gonna do good for you, dude. The Ed Piscor Studio Edition is off to press right now, man. That's exciting. They sent it off. I'm actually not quite sure when they sent it off. It, it was within the past like two or three weeks. So it, it might those those rulers might be churning right now. I have no idea. But that book is is due out in October as well, man. Collecting uh, original like Facsimile scans from the original artwork, full color, so you can see all the pen strokes, all the whiteout and 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 replacement images, all that stuff, man. From Hip Hop Family Tree one through four, uh, each of the X Men books is going to have a couple pages. So uh, the Public Enemy action figure toy designs are in there. Um, with with notations from you, absolutely talking about the different pieces and, and yeah, it's a giant book. You know, it's bigger than the original art size to accommodate for the commentary stuff and to give some, like, a pleasing border, uh, like a picture frame uh, around the images. I like that presentation, and I'm a big fan of the uh, the commentary. Because, I mean, man. that's what you want in these books. Right. You know, like, you want to know more about some it. Clue. You want to get inside the artist's head. I think that's a really, really nice touch. Yeah. Now, of course, they sent mine off to press, and it's coming out in October. Uh, the same time that uh the clouds book is being done man like it's being churned like that's the way fanta does their thing and it makes sense because these things have to come over by way of slow boat from china man so they just want to step they don't want two slow boats from china <laughs> to bring product man so they're making both of our books at the same time and once both are together they'll send it off but i saw clouds cover to uh the thing and it's public information it's public knowledge you could go on amazon and check it out he he drew uh he drew an original piece of art for the thing. It's beautiful. Shocking. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pumped, man. I want both of those books a lot. Yeah, so I can't wait to get Those will be uh, day one purchases for me, and I'm sure uh, the wife will be happy whenever I'm bringing home 75 pounds of books <laughs> that yeah. I don't have room for. Eric Reynolds, co-publisher of Fantagraphics, was like, are you sure you want all of these comps at once? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, of course. Frankly, it's because I'll forget about it. And I don't know that they'll remind me. Got to make some space in the old kayfabe compound, man. wonder how many of those things come in a case. It's got to be like two books a case or something. Yeah, it, I mean, if it even rocks that way. Because this is such a big ticket item and it's so... People are buying one. People, like, stores are ordering one for the person who asks for it. They're not getting two. So, like, what would the reason for there to be a case in a, in, in a yeah. way? It's just more cardboard that has to be paid for, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, well, I'm excited. I think those books are going to be amazing. And uh, it's, 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 I, I'm sure it's uh, a little bit odd to be paired with Dan Clowes and that, like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a giant, but also that's super exciting. Like, that's awesome. Like, who, who better? 
to, to have a book like this come out. When I'm playing around and, and acting with bravado, I say, I agree with you, but that's not the real IDP. <laughs> the other thing that I guess I should note is uh, August, in basically one month from right now, the final X-Men trade is going to be out there. I color the solo issue of, um, or the standalone issue of X-Men. I think it's 247, the one that has Captain America, Black Widow. 268. Good call. Yeah, 268. Um, really important book for me as a kid. I'm excited to see that one recolored too. So it was super fun. There's a couple two-page spreads, man, that I'm like able to stare at. You know, if you printed it out the way it looks on the screen, I think the pages would be about the, because oh right right yes. because a panel zoom in. yeah a panel looks like that big you know on a damn screen when you look at the high resolution so I get to look at this, stare at this Jim Lee so close I I found it very instructional um, that I, is a great era of Jim Lee I think so too I felt that same way about staring at Kirby Kirby mm -hmm. when I colored uh, X Men number one but the odd thing is when I did Giant Size X Men. I didn't feel that way about the Cockrum stuff. I didn't. I don't feel like I learned that much. Hmm. It was very interesting and fun to look at, but I didn't get the takeaways that I thought I might have. I wonder if that's because Kirby and Jim Lee are just so influential. So, like, when you go back and study them, you're not just seeing them. You're also seeing sort of everybody's interpretation of them and, yeah. and these little ticks that have become, like, mainstream and used by everyone. And Dave Cockrum may not have that that degree of influence. Yeah, perhaps. That, that makes sense. That bears out. I would just call attention to the videos we've released this this past week. You know, we put the Bill Sienkiewicz up. Good oh, response right. yeah. there. Super excited by that. I was glad to share that. We put up a layout video middle of the week. And I've been thrilled with the response to that. I've been seeing people posting their own layouts and comments and Super stuff fun. underneath there. Talking about differences. Uh, you know, and one thing I would say is like any of these videos when we're talking process, there is not just one way to do any of this stuff. There's not one right way to do it. Um, and if we went through all of my layouts, you would see like different approaches to, to many of them. So uh, that's something that's been, been fun seeing feedback on that. It seems like that's pretty well received. I think there's a group of people uh, who watch these videos who are aspiring cartoonists or are professional cartoonists. And uh, it's always fun kind of like changing, exchanging notes and, and getting feedback in that uh, technical side, which doesn't happen every week. So uh, that was a pretty fun video to see go up and, and get the response. I agree, man. And uh, this coming week, I think we'll start releasing some of the shoot interviews that we did at Heroes at, at this point. Uh, probably Sunday night, Monday, set it off with Scotty Young, charismatic fella, good talker. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Tell some fun stories. And wh Wednesday... Tuesday, Wednesday, we'll put out some of our, like a mailbag episode. Yes. Yeah, I get uh, I get emails now and then from people that are like, did you get this thing or that thing? And mail is hard to keep up with. We do get uh, uh, quite a volume of mail, and that's awesome. You know, it's, it's good to see. But sometimes we're holding them up in the weeklies, and sometimes we shoot these mailbags, and we have episodes that are already shot and edited, and, you know, when we release them, sometimes gets jostled around a bit. So... It's coming. Uh, you know, st stay tuned for that one. We just had our last uh, screenwriting class of like this four week session, and there's going to be another four week session coming up fairly soon. I got a lot of homework to do, man. Yeah, me too. Ready to split out of here? Yes. K Fabers, if you haven't done so already, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon so we can uh, notify you whenever we have new videos available. You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe merch like this shirt that I'm wearing right here at our spread shop. There's a link below the video for that. And right now, I think through July 18th, use the code SHIP for you, and that is free shipping. I think that's good for another couple days. So while we uh, write our plot points on note cards, man, give these guys their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>